another edition of Wrestling With Faith with your host, me. Again, no surprise there, Dave Abbott. And you can find all the information regarding our podcast and other things that we like to get involved with at Wrestling and Faith, which can be found at Twitter, Faith underscore Wrestling. That's Faith underscore Wrestling. Facebook.com slash Wrestling with Faith UK, all one word. And because I have uh, not had a battle properly a, a proper battle with youtube yet to get the name changed it's currently youtube.com dave abbott uk and that is a double b o double t and we're also on all um mainstream podcasts uh platforms as well spotify uh we're on apple and we're on various other ones through anchor such as google and amazon as well so check us out on there if you don't want to see my ugly mug on the videos and um brings me to um, a guest of mine who we've been playing a bit of uh, DM tennis on Twitter for a few months now. And it's a massive, massive honour for me to have somebody involved in this organisation that is CZW, Combat Zone Wrestling. And it's Shannon. Shannon, how are you doing today? The most important question I'm going to ask you, how are you? I'm great, and uh, thank you so much for being patient with me. It has been a, an incredibly busy and crazy couple of months. Um, obviously, I'm here in the United States. I'm uh, based out of New York City. Obviously, CZW is based um, in Blackwood, New Jersey. Uh, we also are running shows in Philadelphia and in Maryland, um, and so uh, it's it's been a really crazy couple of months I recently um I recently moved <laughs> so it's just been a crazy uh, a crazy couple of months just getting everything together we just did a really huge show for CZW um right in front of the Philadelphia Museum also known as the quote-unquote Rocky Steps <laughs> um so uh and then we are planning Tournament of Death on October 29th. Um, so, and that is the first Tournament of Death since uh, 2019, obviously, because of the pandemic. So a lot of big things happening. And, um, you know, obviously, CZW runs twice a month anyway, once in New Jersey and once in Maryland. Um, so there's just a lot of, a lot of churn happening in general so i really appreciate your patience not at all no honestly listen you're you're obviously one of the busiest promoters uh, at the moment um and uh, excuse my manners shannon hunter i should have introduced you by your full name shannon so i do apologize but i do know how busy and hectic it is speaking to other promoters in the uk as well as canada as well as the us it's full on and when you're promoting something it's all hands on deck in it you know you've got to be really really big with your marketing try and cut as many costs uh, and reduce your overheads as possible with marketing and promoting the shows and czw as we were talking off air it's gone through so many changes uh, since mm -hmm. its inception i think was the inception of it around about the sort of mid to late 90s sort of as the late fall of ECW. i want to say about 98 something like that 97, 98. So yeah. John started, John Zandig started the company 97, 98. I want to say the first time I ever went to a CZW show, I was a photographer when I first started. Um, this is my 24th year in the wrestling business in October. Congratulations. That is um, awesome. Massive achievement. But the first time I ever went to a CZW show, I started as a photographer, which is not unusual, like both Paul Heyman and, and um, Jim Cornette both started as photographers, a lot of sure. people do. But I started as a photographer as well. And so when I was a photographer, um, I was invited by Johnny Cashmere and Trent Acid to come to CZW. And that was when they were still at Champs Arena, which anybody that's an old school CZW fan will remember champs yep. <laughs> um and um so I want to say that had to have been maybe 2000 um and then John owned the company till around 2006 which is uh when DJ Hyde bought the company and DJ uh 
has owned the company since 2006. And he's been through a lot of um, various changes. I mean, I suppose to keep up with the times anyway, any promotion cannot afford to stand still. Um, we've seen, obviously, recently, um, in the last few years, um, we've seen TNA um, sort of crumble and fall apart and then it sort of rose from the rose from the flames again rose from the ashes i should say with impact wrestling and it had to completely refigure how it promoted itself and how it sort of kept its cost down and and obviously where that's based now in universal and obviously we've seen um the the big money from the cans give aew uh, its birth which has just gone on from strength to strength but we've also seen as well you know the one that everybody who knows anything to do with wrestling which is wwe the artist form is known as wwf that has bought out the likes of ecw wcw but has also really i think a lot of wrestling purists would say has really stood still in the last 10 years and has seen more of its hardcore fans gravitate to more things like CZW, GCW, um, New Japan and other wrestling uh, organisations as well. Do you think that CZW has really benefited sort of post-pandemic from a, a new breed of fans? Or do you still think you've got a good mixture of new fans as well as the old school original fans that are really appreciating what you guys are doing? I think that we have a lot of newer fans right now, and here's why. Because DJ has sort of shifted a little bit in terms of focus during the main shows. Uh, we have a lot of people with kids coming, which really wasn't the case in the past. Um, th so there are a lot of kids at our shows. There are a lot of families, a lot of people that you wouldn't have seen at CZW in the past because there's not as much of a focus on death and hardcore yeah. um, on the main shows. So what you really see at CZW right now, which has been a challenge for me, let me tell you a little bit about, a little bit of a segue, a little bit about the work that I do. So my work is a little bit twofold. I do uh, PR and marketing, but I also do talent relations. So um, one of the things on the PR side that has been a little bit challenging to explain to the old school, more hardcore fan is that that is going to still exist. Death is still going to exist in CZW. It will always exist in CZW. That's not going away, but it is going to be separate from what is now existing in CZW that is running on the, in, on the shows in Maryland and the shows at the studio um, that we're doing monthly currently. Um, and that's been sort of challenging to explain. Uh, I think people will calm down about that once we run TOD and then once we run Ultraviolet Underground UVU on a more regular basis. Um, so once they see the division that we have planned in action, I think people will go, okay, this is the product I'm attracted to. And then the other fans that are more interested in a more family friendly or just more wrestling focused product are going to be attracted to that. Some people are going to be attracted to both and they'll go to both. Um, but right now you will see a definite division of here's the, the, the wrestling focused over here, like the, the more technical wrestling focused over here and here's the death match division over here. And that's really been his philosophy moving forward after the pandemic. Yeah. I've liked that as well, because I think it's certainly since, um we've come out of the pandemic i like the, the 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 for me personally as a wrestling fan i like the direction that czw has been going and i think the the sort of the roots for that were were in their pre-pandemic where you're giving a lot more of the newer men and women on the scene an opportunity to showcase themselves um i've noticed in particular being obviously from the uk 
I've seen um, there's a there's, there's been a couple of um, of female uh, UK wrestlers that have been on there as well. Um, so we loved having Mariah. She was really yeah, special. I was just going to say Mariah. Obviously, Zoe was there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, uh, the dolls doing their thing. Um, but it was fantastic, and it and it was nice to see that the you know these women are still able to get these opportunities, but might not necessarily want to be involved in something as hardcore as say maybe back in the day when Nick Gage um and you had Tommy Dreamer coming through the door and and Sammy Callahan coming through the door as well of CZW which yeah. you know let's not kid ourselves here you've had a massive pedigree of stars that maybe when as well known I mean Tommy Dreamer's Tommy Dreamer yeah you know ECW is the house that Tommy built but you know it's when, when we're looking at obviously but also Joe Gacy and John Moxley and exactly. you know, all of these people that you know have gone on to do immense things and then you know we've had people come back Lindsay and and uh, Rich Swan and and all of these people and you know these people have come back and they've really been dedicated to to really helping the people that are there now move forward in their careers and we're so blessed to have them you know Lindsay and Richie and JD Drake and yes. um, and Fred and and we're just really lucky to have the quality of people that we have coming through making sure that both our students and the younger talent that we have. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with our combine process that we had um, where we, um, we had a two day, it was, it's almost like a, 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 an American football combine where people came from all over the country and they participated in, you know, a workout session and then um they were chosen based on the workout sessions to uh, participate in a, a um, you know, a match and, you know, a show in front of an audience. And then wow. based on that, they were chosen to then come onto the roster. So it was a really special process. And, you know, we will, again, I think later this year, or early next year, have another combine, but we found um, some really incredible talent that way. Michael Mastretta, Fab Luandre, um, Jaden Velo, um, people that have been incredible for us and that uh, have integrated into our family um, seamlessly. And we really, really love them. That's awesome as well. And it's great as well that you're in a position where, the likes of Mox can come back, Rich Swan can come back, you know, and, and various others to help get over this new crop of talent. Because let's be honest, you know, it's like any any sports industry, isn't it? You have to have that churn where new blood has to come through on a on a yearly basis. It has to be that way because, you know, not any no one is going to be around forever. No one can, you know, can can keep that week in week out or two shows a month um physically forever so you have to help get these new guys over as well and it's and it's great as well obviously when you delve delve into the archives i mean i I really got to see czw as a fan when i used to watch the bravo channel over here in the uk and we used to get ecw on there late at night which was just awesome i mean you know at the time all we had over here really was WWE after after British Championship Wrestling almost sort of fell apart. I mean, we used to get that on mainstream TV. The likes of Big Daddy, Kendo Nagasaki, uh, Fit Fight and Finlay, who obviously went on to WWE, um, and obviously Davy Boy Smith. You know, this was what we used to have on terrestrial TV before Sky practically swallowed everything up um, on, um, you know, on a, on a subscription basis so all we really had in the uk was wwe and then when i first turned on to stuff like ecw and gz uh, and, and czw it was just like where has this stuff been because this to me is almost like a more expensive version of backyard wrestling it's just it's just got everything i need it's got the characters it's got personalities it's got real figures of real men and women who just seem to just love to get in the ring and just entertain and it's just like a no holes barred thing i mean how did you really get into a promotion like czw as it was at the time i mean did you just love being there as a fan or did you just get an opportunity as a photographer and that was it no um so i um 
I was broken into the business by Fat Frank at Jersey All Pro. And so I worked at Jersey All Pro and um, I ended up being around CZW because people would go back and forth from CZW to G uh, to um, JAP. So Nick Burke and um, Trent Acid and Johnny Cashmere and the late great Z Bar, mm. God rest his soul. Mm. And um, so I had friends in CZW that would invite me, and so that's how I ended up being there. And then off and on, you know, I would go to um to czw i attended tod a couple of times over the years um and then dj and i have had a great 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 close friendship for the past i want to say over 15 years so during the pandemic um an opening came up in my schedule and I said to DJ, you know, as he was sort of re in the rebuilding phase of CZW, I said, you know, what do you need? What can I do for you? And then we started having conversations about, you know, my experience in deathmatch and I had been, you know, sort of floating around the deathmatch scene for the past previous couple of years. And, um, you know, he, we talked about his needs and his wants and what he was looking to do. And then that's how I ended up coming on board, um, sometime in 2020, in early 2020. Um, so that's, that's 2020, 2021, excuse me. Um, and a sort of that's, that's sort of where we are, where we are there. Um, and, uh, and for me, you know, sort of, I am in this sort of deathmatch tradition because, of course, I came up at, at Jersey All Pro, which was the deathmatch promotion. And then I was trained and mentored by both Jason Knight and Rock and Rebel. And, um, and then, of course, too, I came through the doghouse, um, you know, which is the late, great Bobby Lombardi's school where Homicide and Low Key and everybody yeah, came. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so, you know, I have this sort of tradition of, of deathmatch and I've always loved it and enjoyed it. And then sort of, I got reacquainted with it on this later half of my career and, you know, sort of got to know all the newer people and everything like that. And, um, and sort of got reimmersed in it. And then, um, I'm now sort of working to, um, to help this newer generation. Um, you know, I, I wear a lot of different hats. I ring announce, I perform myself, I manage, I, um, I do PR. Um, spinning I do. A, spinning a lot what, of plates then. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. Um, I do talent relations, which basically, you know, is, I'm the buffer or the the liaison between the talent and the and the company. Um, Let's just stick with that for a second. Talent relations. How do you find that as a role? Because obviously, you know, we we spoke off air about the IWC, and you hear lots of this, that, and the other, and unrest backstage at all different promotions all over the world. How do you find being? talent relations obviously like a bridge between the talent and obviously the hierarchy of the company how do you find that that particular part of your overall role within the business well I've been doing this role for many many years and it's actually a rare role on the indies right because like not a lot of places um employ somebody like me they mm. should <laughs> but they yeah. don't yeah um so I've number one, I've owned my own company. Number two, I've done this role for a lot of different companies over the years. And I think it's a really essential role because mm. the guy that owns the company, number one, he doesn't always have time to do the, I don't want to say customer service, but really it is customer service of dealing with the talent, the way they need to be dealt with, you know, 
when you're in a rush, you don't always speak to people the way they need to be spoken to in order for them to feel good about working for you. And I think um, one of the things that I, I know, I know that you see workers complain about, and I know that your, that your um, listeners see workers complain about is unresponsiveness from promoters. I sent an email and I didn't get a response. You know, I inquired about X and I didn't get a response. I sent my footage and I didn't get a response. So the role of somebody like me is to be the person who receives that and responds. Whether it's a positive or a negative response, at least somebody gets a response. Yeah. And I think it give somebody a more positive feeling when somebody says, I'm so sorry, we don't have anything for you right now, but we'll keep you in the loop in the future. Yeah. I'm so sorry. We don't have anything for you because, or, yeah. Hey, you look amazing. Here's a date for you. You know, whatever the response happens to be. But at least they've got a response then at least they've been acknowledged. That's right. the key thing in it. Or if the or if the talent that already works for us has an issue, I'm going to be late. I'm stranded. I have a pay issue. Um, my mom is waiting outside in the cold, and she needs to go to the bathroom. Mm. Any one of 150 things that whatever promoter it is and they can be very nice people hmm. i work with a ton of promoters that are super nice people you know dj steve off from the beautiful steve off from pro wrestling magic all of these people are so wonderful but on a show day they are completely overwhelmed yeah like you need that buffer for talent to go to and say I have an issue. Can you help me? Like, I need water. I'm yeah. hurt. Can you call my mom? Can you call my girlfriend? Like, whatever the whatever the issue is, you know, I'm the person that they're looking to to fix their problem. That's um, awesome. And that must be really, really rewarding as well to be able to help people. Because like say, we all we can all define what is a little issue or, or a big issue, but that's always done on an individual basis, isn't it? Like my little issue might be a big issue to you and vice versa. So it's important that we deal with that. I mean, do you think as a, as a promoter as well as talent relations that how have you seen the welfare of talent change in say the last 14 15 years um i mean we've, 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 zoom's just given me a call we've got eight minutes left okay. but but how how do you see that the 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 welfare of talent and and everybody else behind the scenes in a wrestling promotion has has it has changed or hasn't it and this is still a lot of work to do social social media has fucked everybody up really yeah wow. i mean because because fans did not have the same access to us as they do now. And everybody wants to go online and say, oh, but the message boards, the message boards. It was a completely different issue. And I'll tell you why. Because back in the message board days, number one, we did not have a computer in our pocket mm -hmm. dinging every time somebody said anything negative or positive about us on the fucking message board. Yeah. That's number one. Number two, you had to actually physically go on the message board and engage with that content. You had a choice. Your career was not dictated negatively or positively whether or not you were on the message board but your career is effective negatively if you are not on twitter yeah period yeah so you're on twitter you've got a computer in your fucking pocket and the minute you do something people don't like it's pinging with harassing comments yeah yeah bad news spreads quicker than good news doesn't it and if it, even if it is bad news, if it, like we've said off air, you know, most people don't tend to let the truth get in the way of a good story, do they, sadly, um, and dig into the facts. And that's why a lot of people, and, and the problem is too, you know, a lot of these young men and women, they 
do not have insurance or do not have enough insurance to pay for therapy. They do not have the family support. They do not have the friend support. They don't have the ability to say I'm struggling or they feel ashamed that what's going on online is affecting them so deeply because I feel like there's a lot of shame about that. Um, the, the ability for people to say, you know, this is really, really fucking with me, um, needs to be more normalized because I think it's, um, it's frightening Mm. that people cannot say I'm struggling because I feel overwhelmed by the immensity of what's pouring into me. That's negative. 100% 100% agree. Yeah, 100% agree with that. Um, just on the back of that, then, you're saying about talent and people within the industry being overwhelmed by having these computers in our pockets and things like that. In terms of mental health support, then, on the Indies, it's something that I've asked other people who I've spoke to on the podcast as well, who are very well in the indie circuit in the US and Canada and also the UK as well. And one of the things I've asked is, have they seen any sort of terms of more support out there, not just within the industry, but more accessible support for young men and women, and even the veterans in the industry as well, who struggle with mental health? Because you're preaching to the converted in what you just said there about being overwhelmed. I am a sufferer of mental health. I've I've hit rock bottom. And I know what it's like. And and from that, it inspired me to to do this podcast, but to also be a qualified mental health first aider as well to help support people. How do you find that the industry helps people with those crises? Or do you still think, again, there's, there's a lot more that needs to be done within the business? There's so much more that needs to be done. And there's so much more that needs to be done in privacy, too. I think that's something that really is lacking. There is a guy, and I'm going to have to link you to it when we get off, that is trying to do, like, Zoom meetings for people. He's here in the U.S. He's trying to do Zoom meetings for people awesome. um, that's that's geared toward uh, – wrestler mental health um, that's awesome that's that's for that's sometimes geared for men sometimes geared for women sometimes there was a a seminar that um somebody gave how to navigate social media that was really great so you know people are trying to do stuff but it's like it's really complicated and it's like how do you reach the most people and and things like that and how do you make it free um because people just don't have the money and so so that's that's a huge challenge as well. But I also my biggest thing is, you know, we really have to be cognizant of people's privacy as well. And I'm so cognizant of people's privacy because, you know, here in the United States, we have these things called HIPAA laws. And those are just to protect people um, to make sure that, you know, people don't know your information. And, and for me, uh, that's a real simple, simplistic way of saying it. Um, people are going to be yelling at me, but it's a real simplistic way of saying it. But at the end of the day, I just want to make sure that people get help without having to share their private information about any mental health issues or any medications they might be taking or any struggles they might be having with the public or people who don't know them as well, unless they choose to. Um, I don't want it to be a prerequisite to share that information in order to get help. Yeah. Um, I mean, some some people do find it a therapy to speak openly about it as part of their recovery and as part of beating down those demons of mental right. health. But then again, some people deal with it and they battle those demons better, more productively in a safe space where they don't have to jump onto social media or stand out in a promotion in the middle of a ring and, and say it as well. And there's been various different examples of that, hasn't there? I mean... 
<clears throat> somebody you know uh, well within the business, Eddie Kingston, has been very, very vocal about his battles mm -hmm. with mental health. So as um, W. Morrissey as well, the artist formerly known as Big Kaz, um, he's been very, very open as well online. And I know that EW did something, I think it was pre or during the lockdown, about five, six, seven or eight of their stars, both male and female, talking about their own experiences, which <clears throat> I, I think um, for people who love to watch wrestling, it it's quite humbling to watch as a fan because you see the real person, you know. There's none of this sort of work, shoot, work, shoot, work, shoot side of things. It's just like, no, 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 this is it. This is what we have to go through. And just because we put our bodies on the line and entertain you men and women out there, you don't have to have everything from us. You don't have to have every aspect of our lives. So I think like you just said there, there is a really fine balance. And it's all about, for me, in my experience, how the individual wishes to, to deal with that. You know, right. Because mental health, is, as, as you and I well know, it's not just a one-off for a lot of people. It's a reoccurring event. And we discussed off air as well, like I do with every one of my guests, is what triggers do you have? Because I don't want to say something on this podcast that's going to rock my guest's boat in, in a way, because it, it's not about that. It's This podcast is here to build people up, build their profile, share their loves and experiences within the industry and with faith and with mental health. Um, and I guess... In talent relations, you've got to sometimes try to find line, aren't you, in, in how you speak to people and what you say to people as well. And you really have to get to know people and, and understand as much about their personalities as possible and, you know, be observant and be in the moment with them and, and you know, read the room in a way that sometimes other people in the organization just don't have time for yeah. it's not that they're not good people or nice people or that they don't care but they're off doing other types of jobs oh, you know the the guy running the camera or the guy producing the tv show or the guy um you know that's writing all the storylines may not have that kind of time um so it's it's good to have somebody there who's one of their sole functions is to is to look around and and just sort of take the temperature of everybody in the room try and bridge that gap as well and mm -hmm. highlight any potential long-term things to the people at the top and say look you know we have some talent here that are ready to pop what can we do what can we put in place to to support that as well um just on the back of that as well um obviously we spoke off air as well about faith briefly mm -hmm. and I know what, what faith is to you. And I know um, that you've obviously got, well, in fact, the floor is yours, Shannon. I'll let you tell us how has your faith helped you, especially within the industry? Well, so I don't talk about it a lot because I feel like it can be a hot button issue because I feel like people feel uncomfortable um but i am catholic i was raised catholic and i'm not you know shy to say it um when i was running my own company um wpw which was based out of reading pennsylvania we did um uh lead the locker room in prayer before every show awesome. um and, and nobody objected to it. Um, you know, nobody was forced to participate in it if they were uncomfortable, but nobody, nobody objected to it. Um, and, uh, you know, I feel that for me personally, it was just something that I loved to do. It, it, I like for my locker rooms to feel familial and comfortable and loving and, you know, I'm a hugger and, um, you know, I, I, I like to build a warm environment and uh, praying with my talent just builds a warm environment. Obviously that's not necessarily always something that you're going to do at a place like CZW, but, you know, if somebody wants a blessing, if somebody has anxiety or whatever you know then that's something that i'm always ready willing and able to to do with people if if they want um you know again religion is not something that 
a lot of people discuss in wrestling because again there's there's sort of like a um you know it's kind of a taboo subject because people do you um, feel to be the stigma do you feel do you feel that some people can't talk about their faith because they feel it yes. stigmatizes them or it maybe ruins any character or public perception of of how they're trying to get across in the industry as well Absolutely, because it, you know, because of what's going on politically mm. um, in the United States right now, you know, people attach certain political beliefs onto you. If you ah, have right. religious, um, you know, religious beliefs, which aren't necessarily true, you know, no, like, absolutely. you know, I don't have, I don't have, you know, weird political beliefs based on the fact that I'm Catholic. I, you know, I'm. I'm just as liberal as anybody else, but, you know, I just happen to be Catholic. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that, um, I think that it's just important to, um, you know, I enjoy faith. I enjoy, I enjoy that aspect of it. And if, if anybody enjoys faith too, they're, they're welcome to share it with me, awesome. but, you know, I certainly don't force it upon anybody or. Absolutely. You know, proselytize or you know yeah. talk about it. I think that can that can definitely have a negative effect can it if you start literally walking around and shoving your bible under people's noses it can have a but for, for me it's um and maybe you found this not just in the industry but just in life in general that if you just have the casual chats like we're chatting now and it just comes up it brings up some curiosities doesn't it it does pique people's interest because especially if you said somebody by the way what do you do for a living I work within the wrestling industry. Wasn't expecting that. Okay, curious. Where do we go from here? And it just opens up like faith does. It opens up avenues of conversation. You're not trying to convert somebody. If you can help save somebody, yeah, great. But I find that just having the sit down, casual chat, chilled out, relaxed. But I'm a Christian. Right, okay. Wow, when did that come across? Da, 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 da. Wow, okay then. And just having that more casual you know, I, I got to be honest, it doesn't come up often Yeah. Um, in the wrestling sphere. Um, you know, again, I feel like sometimes the only times it ever comes up is if um, you catch somebody praying and then, you know, you might go over and you pray with them or whatever. Awesome. Yeah. Um, but that's ministry but, though, isn't it? I mean, even on the rare occasions that that happens, that's still ministering with somebody in it. And it's, and it's only a positive, isn't it, if you catch somebody in that moment and you're able to share that with them. Absolutely. And, you know, sometimes sometimes I think, you know, um, people 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 do pray without religion in wrestling because, you know, when you go, every match is dangerous. I don't even the most simplest one. Um, so I think sometimes it's less about religion and more about um simple faith yeah 100%. you know don't let religion get in the way of faith is, is one of the things that i believe in anyway because yeah that could just be quite messy just you know just pray in the spirit and let it be a blessing to other people um really 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 obviously made up that you've shared that aspect of your life as well because you know like you say it doesn't always go hand in hand with any industry faith and whatever you know you it can be a lonely island sometimes if you're if, if you're a person of faith within any organization and not just wrestling um obviously on the back of that as well women's wrestling okay how do you feel it has evolved since you started in the industry um well, you know, I mean, I got to be honest, like women, women's wrestling is, is, I'm more of somebody who enjoys intergender matches. Yeah, which CZW is very big on as well, I've noticed. There's been some intense intergender matches as well in CZW, but Tell me why that appeals to you more, more than any other matches then. Um, you know, because it, it's um, why limit oneself, <laughs> you know? And I think, like, there are a lot of really high-quality female athletes who can just wrestle whoever, you know? Um, 
I, I really do enjoy a lot of the intergender wrestling that is happening right now. And a lot of people don't like that term, but it is what it is. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, but, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you know, I, I really do enjoy when women can just get in and, and wrestle whoever they feel like wrestling um, or be booked against whomsoever, you know, and I think that that's been more of what the evolution of women in wrestling um, has been is that, you know, women can just kind of wrestle yeah. and, you know, the most talented women rise to the top, whether they're in ring talented or most entertaining or can market themselves the best. That's not for anybody to judge. All three of those things are important and they're important in different ways. Um, and, I think people need to remember that men and women probably should be judged on the same things. And there are men that are talented in the ring and there are men that are entertaining. And then there, there are men that market themselves well True. and women are no different. Yes. So, you know, when you're criticizing a woman because you don't think she's very talented in the ring, but you think that she's marketed herself well, well, there are men that, you know, have that same circumstance. So I don't want to hear it. You know, percent, hundred percent. I remember, like when I was first got into wrestling in the nineties, and you you have your heroes, and you know, obviously it was Hulkamania, it was Ultimate Warrior, it was Macho Man, and the the women were, for for want of a better point, were just more often than not, if they were on air, quote unquote managers, um, a sort of an, an an afterthought. And then when you grow up and you and you you really start to understand the technical ability. And the training it takes to be a wrestler in any style, whether it's lucha, strong style, grappling, mat, high flying, whatever it may be. When you look back, a lot of those guys who I grew up and loved and bought the figures from were just guys who were just far more marketable as opposed to quality wrestlers. So it's a great, interesting point that you bring up there because when I look back at that, I think, why did I buy those video games, the, those T-shirts? Why did I put the face paint on and all that? It's because these guys were just literally immortalized through great quality marketing, as opposed to really good out-and-out -out technical wrestlers as well. So, but like you say, if you can combine all three of those, pff, jackpot. But each one individually is important as well. And if you've got somebody that is just great at marketing, you know, and as long as they're safe in the ring, then, you know, they're going to get hired. Nailed on. Shannon, this has been honestly a, an absolute breath of fresh air. And, and I aren't saying that lightly. It's, it's nice to have this sort of insight where it's not, and I'm not saying this to that anybody else I spoke to has done, but you've really, really given us an insight here into what it takes and what goes in and what hard work is involved from everybody involved in the promotion on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not just about the show, the day of the show. It's everything that goes in before and afterwards and, and the continuation of that. Just before we, um, we, we close up here, the floor is yours now. Where can people get all of your information and links to anything and everything that you are tied with? The floor is yours. Well, you should follow me on Twitter at ShayHunter13, S-H-A-E-H-U-N-T-E-R 13. And then you should follow all of the CZW accounts uh, at Combat Zone. I hope I didn't see that. Yeah, I've just seen it. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just at looking Combat at it now. Zone on Twitter. At yep, Combat that's Zone the one. Twitter. And uh, then all you have to do is, on Facebook is search Combat Zone and it will come up. Combat Zone Wrestling, excuse me, and it will come up. And then also, um, and then also, uh, if you want to see both newer and uh, classic uh, CZW footage, uh, you can uh, subscribe to CZW Studios. Awesome. Fantastic. And we're going to drop all those links as well on the YouTube video when this goes out. So if you are watching on YouTube, check out the links below. Click like, subscribe, follow. OK, because honestly, the entertainment value in, in CZW is just another level. It literally gives you, as as we spoke before, 
it gives something for every wrestling fan out there as well. You've got your death matches, you've got your intense hardcore, you've got your intergender matches, and you've just got anybody and everybody just really giving it the all. And there's a lot of great fresh new talent coming through, as well as all the many, you know, the ones who've cut the teeth, like the Moxes, like the Brody Lees, like the Sammy Callahan, like the Nick Gage, and many, 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 many others. Adam Cole as well has mm-hmm. uh, has dawned the CCW um, arena before today. So <clears throat> get on it, guys. Follow, like, subscribe, and get on and support Shannon and support everybody else involved in CCW. Shannon, it's been an absolute pleasure. God bless your sister. Thank you very much for your time. And I hope that we can catch up again in maybe in the new year to see what has evolved with not just yourself, um, but also CCW as well, and to see where you guys are at. I'd love to. Thank you so much. Awesome. God bless. Take care of yourself. Bye, hon.